you very much. Sir. Pleasure, pleasure. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, today is a very special day. Special because uh, we conceptualized this idea of uh, recognizing and giving our tributes to faculties, the doyens, the stalwarts who have shaped the medical education in the country. It's a very humble effort, very small effort. But I'm sure the sentiments behind it are big. There are many stalwarts, there are many doyens who actually have spent their entire lifetime in giving medical education the desired shape in India. And we thought that we should not only listen to them, but also confer on them a Lifetime Achievement Award from our side in recognition of all the hard work and the wisdom and the knowledge that they have given us. Not only they have shaped the educational scenario, but I'm sure many in the audience would agree with me that people like Dr. Mishra have been mentors for many of us. And in fact, whatever we could do in medical education was all because of his uh, encouragement and very supportive atmosphere that he created whenever we went for any meetings or other things. I still remember my first visit to Savangi when I was invited for uh, one of the uh, CMEs which uh, they had organized. Somehow, as luck would have it, Dr. Mishra had to leave to Delhi for some meeting and I could not meet him. But I was told that he was very keen that I should be there. Uh, to be honest, I had not met him before that. But it was so nice and gracious of him to have picked me up and then shaped me into a certain direction so that I could also contribute my humble bit to the whole effort which was going on. So without taking much of your time, I would hand over to Dr. Avinash Supe to chair today's session and request him to introduce the chief guest. Over to you, Dr. Sure. Avinash. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tejinder. I think it's a really honor for me to really chair this session and also um, introduce Professor Dr. Ved Prakash Mishra, who, as Tejinder has rightly said, has made an immense uh, kind of an impression on us and has shaped us our careers actually. Uh, I listened to him about 25 years ago, first time in some conference. And I was extremely mesmerized that time and impressed with his oratory as well as his wisdom. And then over years, I think the whole beauty is that today also I listen to him, I'm still mesmerized. In spite of listening to him a number of times, his whole style has still has a great impression of all of us. And the most important is that if you meet him, when he's not really talking, the wisdom he really gives, the kind of um, uh, wisdom he has really gained from, it may be from Purana to the education to the legal, I think he just continues to shower his wisdom on all of us. I understand his resume is, uh, I'm going to read, which is only a small part of his, uh, what we would like to really share. But it's a, uh, uh, I would just read it for the purposes of everyone. He's professor of excellence, professor of eminence and professor emeritus, Dr. Ved Prakash Mishra. He was conferred with prestigious Dr. B.C. Roy National Award in 2016. He was conferred with DSC, by five Indian Health Science Universities and one DMSC by an Indian Health University for recognition of his selfless services to the cause of medical education in India. He has many positions and hats he has really uh, owned and one is the principal advisor to the Honorable Chancellor and Krishna Institute uh, at Karad. His pro-chancellor, Datta Mega Institute at Savangi as well as Nagpur. Is national head of academic program of Indian program of UNESCO chair by Hifa. 
is member of the International Committee for Bioethics in Asia Pacific Region, advisor to the Human Ethics Committee's Association, Bangalore, and dean academic accreditation National Indian uh, Indian Medical Association, New Delhi. In addition to this, if you really see the list is very long, he is a professor director and professor of advanced physiology. And if you really see, he has been advisor to IMA, various kinds of uh, SARC medical associations, various universities. I think his, this is only a small part of his curriculum. But most important is that when he speaks, he speaks with a particular kind of a thought. His every word he uses has a meaning. And I'm sure all of you are as eager as me to listen to him. Over to Dr. Ved Prakash Mishra. Thank you very much, my learned brother, and a very well-meaning friend to me, who is chairing this session, esteemed Dr. Avinash Supe, a legendary educationist whom I have always admired as an icon in the domain of genuine meaningful reforms in medical education. My another learned brother, esteemed Dr. Tejinder Singh. My learned friend, Dr. Sanjay Bedi, respected Dr. Medha Zoshi. Practically, I can see quite many friends of mine whom I'm fortunate that I shall be interacting with all of you. Chairman, sir, at the outset, I would like to record my very humble sense of thankfulness and gratitude to Dr. Tejinder and the very thoughtfulness that virtually has resulted in initiation of this modality, which I think is something which only he could have thought. And therefore, recording primarily my sense of appreciation, and more than that, my sense of thankfulness and gratitude. In all humility, I would like to say, Dr. Tejinder, a great task you have undertaken. I wish not only my very best, but I render my shoulders to that for all times to come. Today, for the purposes of putting across I would be dealing with the legislative frame that is mandated for the purposes of reforms in medical education in India. Ladies and gentlemen, requirement of reforms in medical education, context in which they are required to be dispensed, concerns which are required to be addressed, challenges which are required to be mitigated, we are all aware of. I am not taking that as a perspective. But the real concern which I'm wanting to put across is when we contemplate reforms in medical education, there are certain inbuilt requirements which have to be deciphered in their most nascent form. We have the world has contemplated health, not only as a human right, but as a fundamental right, which is equitable to every global citizen in this, on this planet. It cannot be extended automatically. It cannot be a magic wand and a miracle that we will be in a position to fulfill in the name of the Sustainable Development Goals. It mandates a robust healthcare delivery system to be dispensing this legitimate expectation and agreeable right of every global citizen in terms of having entitlement of not only right to health, but right to quality health care all his or her life. This robust healthcare delivery system, ladies and gentlemen, needs robust trained health manpower. And therefore this robust trained health manpower, which is needed for the fulfillment of this vital dimension of human right and fundamental right, it turns out to be the owners of medical schools to be capable of generating that competent level of trained man health manpower, which will be in a position to take this mantle of responsibility and dis dispense what is targeted. This basically fundamentally means that the process modality and the entire context and contour of medical education availed for the purposes of generating trained health manpower for the global needs has to be robust, has to be effective, has to be properly organized, has to be well thought of, 
has to be evolved in a mode and manner that not only it is capable of mitigating the contemporary challenges, but it is also capable of taking in tackling the futuristic needs and requirements which are likely to be generated. Therefore, it means and mandates a very comprehensive approach, taking into consideration the situation in totality for the purposes of invocation of the model of medical education, which is required to be put across for the purposes of generation of trained health manpower. When I say this, ladies and gentlemen, I am aware and I would like to catalog that there are certain fundamental concerns which have to be kept in mind. If you take into consideration the five important trends which have a material bearing on evolution and formulation of medical education is, number one, the aging population which is there across the world turns out to be a big challenge. It is this challenge which, is, which cannot be lost sight of. The second most important, which I narrated in brief, demand for quality, equity, and dignity in the domain of healthcare. One of the most important aspects which I'm wanting to put across, the trinity of quality at one hand, equity at the second hand, and dignity at the third hand, how exactly all the three are required to be interwoven for the purposes of extension and genuine extension of a robust healthcare delivery system turns out to be a cardinal consideration which merits all attention by all formulators of the educational plan. We are all well aware, ladies and gentlemen, the global trend of the disease burden which has altered from communicable diseases to non-communicable diseases. Interalia, the entire concept of episodic illness stands transformed into what we construe as lifelong ailments. A huge paradigm shift. But this paradigm shift is not universally applicable. Developing countries like ours, we are required to be sustaining double disease burden in terms of both communicable and non-communicable diseases. And most important, which I would like to list as one of most significant cardinal factor is generation genesis and rapid genesis of disruptive technologies as a matter of advancement of science and technology. These five cardinal considerations, ladies and gentlemen, they impact every aspect of human life. And therefore, medical education as a repository cannot be immune from impact of these five important dimensions. It is in this context that it is not only reform in one go, but continual reforms are mandated in medical education in order to make the entire system relevant, consequential, timely, impactful, and above all, efficiently effective. All these are not ornamental words which I'm using. The international summit which contemplated the nature of the healthcare and therefore the resultant nature of medical education. It defined all these five parables to be incorporated in the model of medical education so that it turns out to be a throughput for the purposes of generating an output which will be in a position to render to that larger cause. When I am wanting to put across this focus, ladies and gentlemen, there is a second important focus which I would also like to address before I embark onto the legislative frame. If you take into consideration the periodicity which is required for doubling of medical knowledge, I am giving you four important milestones, ladies and gentlemen. In the year 1950, it was estimated that time required for doubling of medical knowledge was, Chairman Sir, 50 years, 5050 years was something which was there in 1950. If you take the benchmark in 1980, that doubling period, which was 50 years in 1950, what reduced down to 7.5, 7 years in 1980. If you see that the estimation in the year 2010, doubling time for medical knowledge got reduced down to 3.5 years. And the projection and the computation which has been carried for doubling of medical knowledge in 2020 is 0 0.2 years, that is equivalent to 73 days. These are the four important milestones which I'm wanting to focus. Doubling time, which was 50 years in year 1950, in the year 2020, just 70 years apart, it is reduced down to 0 0.2 years from the original 50 years. And therefore, what I'm wanting to bring across and what I'm wanting all of us to focus on is the nature, the rapidity, 
the transformation which is mandated in the context of this doubling time of the knowledge and mind well it is not a static phenomena from 50 years if it has been reduced down to 0.2 contemplate what will be the situation in 2025 what will be the doubling time which will be in, in, invoked in the year 2030 and maybe subsequent time there too in other words the classical dictum which was put across that in terms of the growth of science and technology and technological disruptions maybe we will reach a stage that what is relevant in the forenoon may turn out to be irrelevant inter alia obsolete in the afternoon it is in this gamut it is in this context ladies and gentlemen the entire frame of medical education needs to be formulated the point which i am trying to drive home is the timeliness of the reforms the rapidity of the reforms the initiation of the reforms when they are needed the most and therefore delays and latches if caused in any manner how detrimental and how prejudicial they can result into is the main focus which i am wanting to put across and therefore the concern which i am wanting to be bringing into acute understanding for all of us is and having been part of this particular entire process for almost more than 3 and a half decades having a first person participation at various levels including the regulatory frame i am wanting to commit to this learned gathering that we have never been in a position to be contemporary to answering of the challenges for several reasons several constraints which unfortunately are all avoidable this is the basic underlining mechanism which i am wanting to ultimately i am taking you back to certain parables of historicity ladies and gentlemen the regulatory frame of medical education if you are really wanting to take in the indian context there are certain years and dates which have to be borne in mind so that we are able to take the entire perspective into chronological order 1904 the first education commission which which was constituted by the british for medical education it submitted its report which resulted in generation of indian medical degrees act 1916 which conceptualized the conferment of medical qualifications in the domain of western medicine but not by indian universities then 1933 34 indian medical council act pre independence incorporating the definition of the medicine as western medicine came into existence post independence 1948 first education commission constituted by the government of india under the chairmanship of dr sarvapalli dr radha krishnan 52 the report is submitted and 1956 indian medical council act 1956 adopted by the parliament repealing the 1933 34 act which was invoked till then resulting in constitution of a regulatory frame called as indian medical council or medical council of india in the post independence era 1982 the important landmark balwantrai mehta committee which gave a new fillip to the entire concept of medical education with reference to the healthcare delivery in terms of primary healthcare as a matter of primary concern 1986 manpower recruitment manpower management and manpower propositions incorporated in the domain of health and medical education under js bajaj committee report a important landmark 2007 planning commission task force on medical education turns out to be yet another important recommendatory frame 2008 National Knowledge Commission constituted and the report thereof pertaining to the medical education emanating thereof turns out to be an important landmark. 2011, one of the important aspects generated was a concept of unitary national health commission, which was proposed but which came to be withdrawn subsequently. 2015, expert committee under the leadership of Dr. Ranjit Rai Chaudhary, wanting the overall of the regulatory frame in the interest of. generation of a model of medical education which will be contemporary to the needs and relevant which resulted in generation of nn national medical commission bill proposed by the by the government of india in the year 2017 and finally it came to be adopted in the form of national medical commission act 2019 i am giving this chronology deliberately ladies and gentlemen that this is the entire situation in which the purpose of formulation of medical education in the context of this is aimed at what it is not just the registry of registered medical practitioners the basic underlying concept in all these reports is that in a huge country like ours where the number of medical schools will be huge and wide in number 
they will be working in different socio economic milieu in terms of the regional distributions and in terms of the regional requirements there is essentially a modality which is needed for invocation of a basal unit be it the concept which was worked out in the year 1934 be it the concept which was evolved in the year 1956 be it the recommendations of balwant rai mehta committee be it the recommendations of dr j s bajaj committee read the recommendations of the expert group constituted by the planning commission under the chairmanship of dr mukherjee read the 2011 conceptual frame of national medical health commission or the dr ranjit roy choudhury committee report resulting in generation of the national medical commission act and resulting in finally the replacement of the medical council of india by national medical commission the underlining principle is that in a country like india there has to be a basal uniformity for the purposes of operation of medical education in medical schools in this country and therefore this basal uniformity is required to be brought in what manner it was thought that we will be in a position to prescribe the guidelines and therefore up to the year 1997 what were notified for the purposes of achieving the structuring of the medical education in this country through the regulatory frame through the universities but primarily coming from the constituted medical council of india was in the form of guidelines whether those guidelines are discretionary or mandatory this question was to be tested and this question was tested before the supreme court through a petition which in the year 1995 and then subsequent final judgment in 1996 said that these guidelines have got all the force of a regulation and they are not discretionary they are mandatory because they will have the status of a central enactment in the form of subordinate legislation i take this as a landmark judgment and a landmark interpretation for the purposes of uniformity to be invoked in medical education across this country without the prejudice to the autonomy of the examining university for its upgradation i am making this very loud and clear those who criticize that this uniformity has resulted in water jacketing or and tight uh, regulation of the medical education in this country this never took away the liberty of or the autonomy of the universities as examining universities to go in for upgradation it was something that tinkering with the basal requirements was not open to but otherwise upgradation was left to the university therefore recognition entailed basal compliance with the stipulations but that that did not mean that there was any embargo or restriction on any upgradation of the same by the examining university having said so i will touch that particular sphere later at this juncture what i am wanting to put across is for the purposes of invocation of this uniformity the interpretative judgment by the supreme court that regulatory body will be entitled to work out its guidelines in the form of a regulation and then the scope and ambit of section 33 of the indian medical council act came into being indian medical council act section 33 clearly provides that the council with the prior approval of the government will be able to prescribe regulations on the matters which have been included in the form of entries listed from c rating small a to c rating small k these are the matters which are all academic matters ladies and gentlemen be it the curriculum be it the minimum standard requirement be it the structuring of the curriculum be it the formulation of the standard time table be it the teeth computation of working hours be it the teeth the requirement of manpower be it the requirement of infrastructure you name a situation which is required it is incorporated that it will be regulated through issuance of a regulation and it was in terms of this interpretation ladies and gentlemen that the most important regulation which i can foresee as graduate medical education regulation of 1997 having a mandatory impact having a mandatory jurisdiction incorporating the recommendation of creation of a medical education unit is the hallmark of uniform shaping of medical education incorporating including the recommendations of horizontal and vertical integration in the structuring of the curriculum came into operation through 1997 graduate medical education regulation but the point at home which i am drawing is not just a significant structuring of the milestone development of recommendations or regulations being mandatory 
what i'm trying to focus is the important limitation which i have which i have been a victim of all along even as the chairman of the post graduate committee of medical council of india for 15 years and also as chairman of the academic council of the medical council of india for a similar period the limitation is that on all academic matters council is in a position to prescribe the regulation regulation can be prescribed by the group of experts for which i had constituted expert bodies in the form of board of studies dr avinash supe and many others including dr tejinder they all have been the contributors on that particular count in the in that standing mechanism but what was the limitation the limitation is that you will be able to notify the regulation only upon the prior approval of the government and it will be then notified into the official gazette and it will come into operation from the date on which it is officially gazetted ladies and gentlemen let me put it across very succinctly and clearly what was contemplated in graduate medical education regulation it started in the year 1993 with that national workshop where practically various medical colleges participated in delhi which resulted in working out a crystallized recommendation for structuring of the medical education in this country in the name of rome and other contemporary developments at that particular point of time it was ready in the year 1995 passed on through adoption of the various bodies in the council and it was lying there with the government of india for approval so that it can be notified and the required period was more than two and a half years you name a regulation which has been notified by the council where in the gestation period with the government of india for the purposes of a technical approval a technical formality council as an expert body and the standing mechanisms of expert groups have been critically looked into and have been formulated it was only a babu's approval which took almost on an average you name a regulation 17 regulations were been structured and in the average time for prior approval to be granted to these regulations for the purposes of notification ladies and gentlemen is taken it is usually minimum is 2 and 1/2 years and maximum is 4 years so the average somewhere comes to 3 years time which is needed for the grant of approval i am still not in a position to understand on academic matters when you say that the legislative frame and when the supreme court interpreted that the regulations which will be notified under section 33 of the indian medical council act they will be having the spores of a central enactment in spite of the fact that medical education is in the concurrent list of subject because the basic purpose of the legislative intent of creation of this modality is a near uniformity to be structured at the basal level for operational purposes of medical education in this vast country of ours which will have multiple educational centers for the purposes of imparting of instructions it is in this context what i am wanting to raise ladies and gentlemen at one end i am talking of the timeliness for which i gave you a parable of doubling time of medical knowledge when doubling time was 50 years four years delay was understandable when doubling time in the year 2010 is reduced down to 3.5 years the, the four years is far more a time than to be consumed for the purposes of technical approval and mind well ladies and gentlemen when doubling time of medical knowledge is reduced down to 0.2 hours what is exactly the idea of timeliness not the timeliness of the notification of regulatory frame which will be governing the entire scenario of medical education to be invoked in this country is a speculation which i am wanting you to put across and it is in that context one of the basic propositions which i always advocated with the government of india and adopting that in the form of various propositions is that if we want timely academic updates and timely academic reforms to be incorporated in the domain of medical education so as to make it contemporarily relevant and timely in nature then the autonomy on academic matters with the legislative jurisdiction should be left with the expert bodies and should not be requiring the approval of the government of india or for that matter including the endorsement of the formality of tabling it before the two houses of the parliament before they are coming into operation i do not want to belittle the legislative process i am nobody having full respect as a democratic person to the entire legislative frame mind well ladies and gentlemen regulations are subordinate legislation 
and therefore these subordinate legislations could be categorized into few different categories. Any legislation that has got financial bearing, I can understand a governmental approval being warranted on that count. But any and every legislation which is dealing with an academic aspect, which is dealing with an academic contour, which is contemplating an academic purview exclusively in the interest of academics, which does not have any financial liability of any type, which does not invoke any other jurisdiction other than its academic nature, why it should not be vested with the expert body so that instead of the bureaucratic and latches and delays being caused in the entire situation, it could be notified in the nick of time. Autonomy for academic matters is one important aspect which is coming as a huge obstacle for the purposes of timely notification and timely implementation of the various academic programs. Dr. Chairman, sir, you are well aware that the competency-based medical education undertaking in the form of modified graduate medical regulation, modified teacher's eligibility qualification regulation, modified minimum standard requirement regulation, and that also five in number for the intake of 50, for the intake of 100, for the annual intake of 150, for the annual intake of 200, and for the annual intake of 250. We all ventured in the year 1990, in the year 2014, we had completed our task entirely by the end of 2016. And when we were claiming almost the approval for the same, the approval comes in the year 2019. What I'm trying to put across is competency-based medical education, which this country has seen in the, for the graduate educational program in the two year 2019, could have been implemented if the timely approval would have been given in the academic year 2017 itself. I am personal privy to that. Dr. Supe will be here with me, Dr. Tejinder will be here with me, and quite many other people who are listening to me, who were a party to the structuring of that entire exercise, they will be here with me. Entire documentation was ready. It was adopted by the executive committee. It was adopted by the postgraduate committee. It was adopted by the general body. Four meetings were held with the government of India for the purposes of clearances. And what exactly turned out to be the outcome was it was buried into the cold storage and had the requirement of limitation of 2023 by WHO, inclusion of only accredited, coll accredited colleges in the WHO directory and not the date ending on, 23, on 31st of July 2023. If that sort of democracy would not have been there, competency-based medical education even could not have seen the light of the day. Even in 2019, I can vouch for it. What, why I'm trying to tell you is this, that I'm not making any accusation against anybody. I'm basically wanting to put across a point. Having been associated with this entire forum for such a long time, my experience makes me to tell you emphatically that academic autonomy vested with the body of academic experts is mandated for the timely completion of the academic tasks to be regulated and to be put across into implementation in a timely manner so that they are in a position to have the desired optimal outcome. They cannot be, they should not be, they need not be, and they must not be subjected to any such processes which ultimately amount to causing avoidable delays and latches. And therefore, I said, these are avoidable in character. Having worked out this proposition, ladies and gentlemen, I am now coming to what was incorporated in Section 33 of the Indian Medical Council Act with the prior approval. Now, let us come to identify what is the position in the 2019 NMC Act. Section 33 of the IMC Act gets converted into Section 57 of the NMC Act. I would like all of you to read Section 57 very carefully. And I am just wanting you, wanting the attention of this August gathering to be drawn to section 57 of the NMC Act, primarily for the purposes of bringing into focus, nothing significantly has changed. You read section 57 and 58, you will be finding that even under the purview of the NMC Act, the academic autonomy, which, is, which was not there in the Indian Medical Council Act, continues to be so even in the NMC Act. The possibility of timely regulatory frame being put across for the purposes of governance of medical education in the desired time frame perhaps would be even eluding in the teeth of provisions included at section 57 and section 56 and section 57 of the uh, section 57 and 58 
of the NMC Act. Therefore, in regard to the academic autonomy for timely regulatory frame, perhaps is still eluding the Indian scenario is a concern which I wanted to put across. And therefore, when I said legislative frame, if it is not timely, who is to bear the consequences of it? Who is to bear the brunt of it? Experts body do their job. Experts dispense their responsibilities. They burn their labor. They burn their sweat. They put in the hardest possible labor. Put across everything. And everything when it is ready, instead of it being seeing the light of the day, it is absolutely dumped into a babu dump for the purposes of a technical approval. Why this requirement of technical approval should not be done away with in the interest of timely dispensation of the academic requirements in the domain of medical education because it entails huge, large, significant and vital consequences is a million dollar question which I want to put across. There are two or three important dimensions which I would like to flag, ladies and gentlemen. One, whatever mechanism that we are talking about, the reforms in medical education, we are dealing with minimum standard requirements. When we talk of quality centricity, Quality, centricity, and minimum requirements do not go hand in hand. We have now, the NMC Act has provided for an autonomous accreditation and rating board. Otherwise, medical education did not have an independent rating agency for itself. National Assessment and Accreditation Council, it was created under the UGC for higher education, not for medical education. Medical IMC Act did not have any provision for academic rating. Provisions are inbuilt into it. And therefore, the regulatory frame for the purpose of accreditation, quality-centric certification, ratings of medical education in this country will require a regulation on accreditation and rating. It will be subjected to the same rigmarole. Imagine, 19, 2019, the act is passed. 2019, the National Medical Commission has come into operation. 2023 is the cutout date before which we are required to be accredited to be included in the WHO directory of, school, the directory of schools. If not accredited before 31st of July 2023, we will be outside the WHO directory of medical schools in the global level. The mandate today we have got 560, 581 medical schools. How are we going to accredit them? What will be the modality? Where is the regulation? when the regulation will come, what modalities for the purposes of the accreditation certification will be adopted. Absolutely, we are not aware and perhaps nobody knows it. And therefore, what I'm trying to put across is a vital count of educational reform which is mandated in the form of certification of accreditation it still eludes medical education. And that's a significant concern which will be governed by legislative frame. But how exactly that legislative frame is going to come in operation? And whether if the past is expected to bear a testimony, that if the bottlenecks through which any academic regulation was required to go, God forbid, even the accreditation regulation is subjected to the same. I am just wanting all of us to speculate and realize what would be the entailing consequences there too. What is the extent of likely harm and prejudice which can be caused as a result of the same? I am leaving it to, 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 for all of us to decipher for ourselves. The third important aspect which I'm wanting to put across, ladies and gentlemen, is all of us are talking about the unequal distribution and geographic location of medical schools in this country. Where is the regulatory frame? We contemplate a desirable distribution. Kartar Singh report worked out in terms of the population ratio. Why we have not been able to evoke it? Be it the Section 10A of the IMC Act and be it the Section Present 23 of the NMC Act, there is no regulatory frame on geographic location of a medical college. We had suggested, I had proposed, and this has been a part of the entire approval which has been accorded, that why should there not be a perspective, national perspective plan for geographic location of medical schools for every five years, taking into consideration the mandate of Article 371, subsection 2 of the Constitution of India on the basis of socio-economic profile of geographic location of the region in the country. Our founding fathers in the constitution very clearly spelled out this particular requirement. Why should that constitutional provision not be availed for structuring every five year a national perspective development and plan of geographic location of medical colleges to be exclusively worked out on the basis of 
socio-economic matrices metric, identified so that availing the mandate incorporated under Article 371, subsection 2 of the Constitution of India. It will definitely cater to a cause. That is the legislative frame which is mandated. That is the legislative requirement which is mandated. Otherwise, the concern that we are addressing, we will never be in a position to address that in any manner in without getting worked out on this particular formulation. I have yet another important issue to flag, ladies and gentlemen. Arising out of the first Education Commission report of Dr. Radha Krishnan in the year 1956, two important legislative enactments came to be adopted by the parliament. One was Indian Medical Council Act 1956, repealing the 1934 Indian Medical Council Act formulated by formulated in the pre-independence era. But for higher education, what was constituted? It was University Grants Commission. Medical education had a council, but higher education had a commission. What was the difference? The difference was that amongst the various responsibilities for higher education, University Grants Commission was vested with the authority of disbursement of the developmental grants for higher education out of the corpus created through every five-year developmental plan. And I am specifically drawing the attention of all of us to section 12, subsection B, B for Bombay of the University Grants Commission Act. Where is the applicability of section 12B or a similar provision for medical education in this country? Medical education has been bereft of any developmental grants of any type from government of India for anybody because medical education had never the benefit of a provision like Section 12B because it had the council and under the commission, medical education was not coming for regulation. It was outside the ambit of University Grants Commission. Hence, medical education has always been bereft of the provisions of Section 12B or similar provisions like as the University Grants Commission Act had. What was the net result? The net result is for all of us to see. Now let us examine the provisions of NMC Act. Where does NMC Act give any financial corpus to National Medical Commission akin to University Grants Commission? It does not. Council is converted into commission. That University Grants Commission, which has got financial outlay for disbursement of higher education, National Medical Commission is akin to University Grants Commission. It is protected for the purposes of regulatory frame of medical education, even in the 66-page National Education Policy Document of 2020. But it does not have any financial outlay. It does not have any provision akin to Section 12B in the University Grants Commission Act, whereby medical education will be entitled for developmental grants. What, was, what medical education has been denied from 1956 till date, continues to be denied even under the tenets and provisions of the NMC Act 2019. And therefore, one of the important considerations which is vital for its developmental profile is missing in the domain of medical education. I think which should be a matter of real great concern to all of you when it comes to, because this will also need not only a legislative frame, this will need an amendment to the Act itself by the two houses of the parliament so as to make medical education equitable in terms of the developmental corpus out of the public funding in tune or on par with higher education in the form of University Grants Commission. I have another important dimension to add, ladies and gentlemen. If you look at the provision of maintenance of the NMC under the National Education Policy document, then I am worried the National Research Fund, which is going to be the apical research funding agency, whether it will cover medical education in its domain or not turns out to be a matter of great speculation. Because the principles which are laid down in that policy will be applicable to that national reaching, overreaching body, which will be created, which will be for medical education, it will be National Medical Commission. National Medical Commission does not have any provisions for national research funding corpus. It does not have any provision for developmental corpus. Therefore, how exactly these areas will be tackled? Because they have got a material bearing on the entire reform structure and pro on the prospects of medical education in times to come. And we have no answers because legislative frame on that particular count is missing. I am wanting to flag these issues for discussion, ladies and gentlemen, so that we apply our mind. Whatever little I could decipher out of, out of it, I am trying to put across for the consideration of this learned gathering. 
Another important issue which I'm wanting to flag, ladies and gentlemen, we all talk about evidence-based healthcare delivery system. Absolutely fine. That is the global dictum. My only worry is evidence-based healthcare delivery system, can it be generated in absence of evidence-based medical education? And therefore, where is the evidence which is available for the purposes of formation or reformation or transformation of medical education? Therefore, the emphasis on educational research, giving its due diligence, giving it its due recognition, bringing it on par with the specialty research, which in, even in regard to placement and promotion of the medical faculty, turns out to be yet another important dimension, which has to be brought into the legislative frame in what we call as teachers' eligibility qualification regulation. So that we, in due course of time, we are in a position to work out an evidence-based medical education in this country, catering to the cause of generation of evidence-based healthcare delivery system. And last, ladies and gentlemen, in the list, which I'm wanting to flag, I'm drawing specifically the attention of all of you to Section 51 of the National Medical Council Act. Please interpolate Section 51 of the NMC Act with para 20.2 and para 20.5 of the National Education Policy Document of Government of India 2020. It's a 66 page document in which medical education is reflected in para 20.2 and 20.5. Read the three things together and we will be finding that perhaps the shape of modern medicine itself is going to be in a huge difficulty in the name of a possible probability of an essence of mixopathy lurking its face behind somewhere. It's a concern. And I am putting across the legislative frames which are already in vogue on this particular count. Therefore, I, I, I intend to flag even that issue for the consideration of all concerned as to what impact it will have. What are the consequences there? What will be the situation which will be generated as a result of this trinity of correlation which I'm wanting to flag across? We are all thinking people. We have, we have medical education has given us all that we have in our lives. We need, we are indebted to medical education. Our identity is medical education. Our mother repository is medical education. What we are wanting to return back to it is a million dollar question. We owe it to, we owe to it. And therefore, in the name of that owing, I'm wanting to flag legislative frame, if it is worked out properly, and if it is worked out appropriately and timely, it is the essence which is capable of doing the real good in terms of shaping, formulating, structuring, and executing of reformed medical education. Therefore, legislative frame turns out to be one of the cardinal parameters which ultimately results in the edifice, core edifice for the governance of medical education at all levels, in all frames, in all situations in our country. Therefore, that turns out to be an important area. In this maiden lecture of mine, my main purpose was to bring out the importance of legislative frame, relevance of legislative frame, present status of legislative frame, the bottlenecks which have been which has resulted because of the present legislative frame, modified legislative frames, concerns there too, and perhaps we need to work out a way ahead out of these particular propositions. My purpose was to bring that entire status, what I was in a position to decipher in terms of the present reading of the present formulation through this lecture for the information of all concerned. If there is any inadequacy in it, if there is any infirmity in it, I owe that inadequacy and infirmity. If there is any possibility of understanding anywhere, perhaps that is the limitation of my understanding. But my intent is, in all fairness, to bring out this facet for the information, knowledge, consideration, and discussion of well-meaning brains like all of you in this country in the larger interest of reformed medical education for the purposes of it being evidence-based and also it generating such manpower which will be in a position to genuinely cater to the cause of robust, effective, efficient, affordable, timely healthcare delivery system, realizing the global dream of fulfillment of health as a fundamental right accruable to all the global citizens for all times to come, whereby this planet turns out to be a real place of worthy living for all concerned in times to come. Thank you very much, Chairman, sir. 
and thank you everybody for giving me this patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mishra, sir. What an insightful lecture. I think I'm really uh, thoroughly still mesmerized with this. The way you really brought up this legal framework from doubling time to the uh, the whole concept and from national perspective plan to mixopathy to financial to legal framework, you have really opened up the whole window and have made us all think. I think that was really fantastic. Thank you so much, sir. I think I'm sure all of us have really uh, enjoyed it and have made us think much more. Now over to Dr. Tejinder for further proceedings. Thank you, uh, Dr. Avinash. And I am really indebted to Dr. Ved Prakash Mishra for sharing with us some of the things which probably would, would have never bothered to read about or we would have never understood. We all craved about delays and so many other things, but we didn't really know what kind of processes are involved and what really happens at the back end. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you once again. Pleasure. Pleasure. It's our privilege to confer the Lifetime Achievement Award on you, sir. And uh, I request Dr. Sanjay Bedi to kindly join me in presenting the Lifetime Achievement Award to Dr. Ved Prakash Mishra. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Tejender, Dr. Sanjay, Dr. Avinash. In all humility and with great sense of gratitude, I have great pleasure in accepting this life, Lifetime Achievement Award conferred on me. I will always revere it and I shall always be making my utmost attempts to be true to the spirit of this award all, all rest of my life. I remain indebted to medical education and I would love to remain indebted to it all my life. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Can I invite Dr. Medha Joshi to please propose a vote of thanks? Uh, thank you, Dr. Tejinder Singh. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ved Prakash, sir. Such an excellent, uh, as you said, mesmerizing, uh, talk that we had and uh, it really opened up so many uh, avenues and so many ideas in each. I think uh, all the people who are attending it now have got a little clear, clearer idea about what the framework really uh, is due to. So, and thank you so much uh, for giving such an excellent uh, oration. Thank you very much uh, pleasure, for spending pleasure. your time with all of us and uh, enlightening us on this issue. I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Avinash Supe for his uh, chairmanship and Dr. Tejinder Singh for conducting this uh, proceedings. Thank you very much. And Dr. Uh, Sanjay Bedi for giving me this opportunity to thank. And this, uh, I'm sure uh, all the participants should be also thanked for uh, being present and uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you must have gained a lot of insight into how the things work, legislative things work and how we can contribute to maybe making it a little better in terms of spreading the awareness among our faculty members. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Meda. And thank you. Thank you everyone for being with us and uh, trying to help us with paying our little humble tributes and our gratitude to the stalwarts who have really shaped the medical education and will keep on doing so. Thank you very much once again and a good time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.